All right. All right. Okay. So, so today we're going to be talking about the Orphic Mysteries, uh, obviously centered around Orpheus, uh, and parts of it go into the idea of his descent into the underworld, into Hades, and obviously he comes back. Gives us a little bit of hope there. Uh, also, part of these mysteries is Persephone. And guess what happens to her? Yeah, she goes into the underworld. And she also comes back again. So as you can see already, uh, Orphism is about the hope for returning, or I should say, eternal life. The idea that you can be saved. Well, that's interesting. Huh, that sounds like a few other religions I've heard about. So let's go there right now. Okay, so when we look at Orphism, uh, obviously we have to look at the figure of Orpheus, and he does remain a rather shadowy composite kind of figure, uh, unfortunately, but um, <clears throat> there's also another figure that's connected to Orpheus, and you may not have heard it before, and his name is Musius. Uh, so Orpheus and Musius. Uh, sometimes these two are used indistinguishable from one another. So in many cases, they'll say that Orpheus is the founder of the mysteries, and they will say Musius as the author of the oracles, the author of the Orphic oracle. So there you have it. But there is another figure, a third historical figure that is uh, important, but is not exactly a household name. Uh, his name is Onomacritus, Onomacritus. Well, after this lecture, you'll know all about Onomacritus. He lived from 530 to 480 BCE, and he is connected in the ancient perspective to the Orphic epics. And he, in fact, he is described uh, as composing the Orphic poems and editing the uh, oracles of Musius in many different places. In fact, uh, a person uh, who lived in the second century CE, he's a famous geographer, his name is Pausanias, says as follows about um, uh, Onomacritus. He says, uh -um. here we go, uh, Onomacritus uh, took over the name of the Titans from Homer and instituted the Orgia for Dionysus and invented the story that the Titans caused the suffering of Dionysus, unquote. So already you have this ancient authority uh, saying that, hey, you know what? We know the guy who put it all together. We know the guy's name who wrote it. According to Herodotus, Onomacritus was exiled from Athens uh, by Hipparchus, who was the son of Pisistratus, right? Uh, because of the fact that his um, editorial methods concerning the oracles of Orpheus had much to be desired. What I mean by that is uh, it didn't look favorable for him in political office. So he found himself exiled to guess where? Well, way out of Athens, that's for sure. He ends up in Persia working for the Persian king, at which point uh, it turns out the family of Pi Pisistratus says, you know, we could use this guy there as our special agent. We're sorry about how we treated you. Can you give some kind of false oracles uh, to the Persian king to make it seem like, you know, uh, that we're defenseless and nothing will happen uh, uh, to him if he may attack? And of course, obviously, you could see that uh, he was used uh, for the Athenians' advantage. Okay, so there you have it. Um, uh, it is believed that Onomacritus did not merely edit the Orphic works, but also composed many himself. According to <laughs> Philostratus, uh, Philoponus, excuse me, uh, even the great philosopher Aristotle held this view. So there you have it. Okay, uh, Pausanias in the second century CE states that it was Onomacritus who wrote the also the about the orgies of Dionysus, as well as discussing uh, the gods' dismemberment of the Titans. And it's interesting because uh, many scholars believe that uh, there's a there's a very a complicated uh, theogony of Onomacritus that kind of goes into well, 
uh, the beginning or the origins of the, uh, the universe. And it is believed that fragments of this, parts of this uh, will be uh, used by the Neoplatonic philosophers. Uh, in fact, uh, it's called the Rhapsodic Theogony and Proclus uh, and Damascius and Olympodorus and others will use this when it comes to the idea of the journey of the soul. Okay, I know this old man may seem Greek to you and you know what? It is Greek. <laughs> okay, that's a bad joke. I'm, I'm gonna stop. All right, so, uh, so let's get into some of the good stuff. I had to kind of go uh, give you some kind of background here. Uh, in addition uh, to the works ascribed to Orpheus and Musaeus edited by Onomacritus, there are 88 Orphic hymns uh, that were in circulation as well. These hymns begin with a hymn of Orpheus dedicated to his son, Musius. And you're going, wait, he shouldn't have a son. It tells you already that there's lots of different kinds of traditions going on. Uh, with the rest of the hymns dedicated to the various uh, Greek gods, but with three of the gods, uh, Missa, Hipta, and Melone, um, which we cut, most of us have never heard of before. However, as it turns out, these particular three gods uh, we find in the inscriptions from a place known as Pergamum, uh, which is located, of course, in the province of Asia, Turkey today. And the providence is there. And this interesting cycle uh, of hymns uh, must have been dedicated to the temple of Demeter that's located there. And there is internal evidence that reveals that the author of these particular hymns were followers of a famous philosopher by the name of Pythagoras. Now we'll get somewhere. Pythagoras, what do you mean? Pythagoras was one of the followers or of the Orphic mysteries. In fact, also, you guys ever heard of Plato? Well, he sometimes played around with many of the ideas and the imagery of it. And some, some people say that uh, he sort of believed and sort of didn't, kind of back and forth. Uh, so it's interesting. In fact, some scholars say that, uh, uh, that uh, Pythagoras is the inspiration for a lot of the ideas uh, within the Orphic Mysteries, and we are going to go there during this lecture. Never fear. Uh, as far as Orpheus himself, who, who was Orpheus? Really, who was he? Well, uh, we are definitely dealing with the realm of legend, dealing with the realm of myth, uh, it is said that he was a uh, musical sage, uh, and he lived prior to the time of Homer, uh, and who, of course, is likewise a, a shadowy figure, right? So, uh, so um, and of course, Orpheus is projected oftentimes into the heroic age. Uh, now, of course, we have a fly in our pristine ointment with Herodotus who believes <laughs> that the, the poems of Homer were earlier than all the rest, Orpheus included. So there's kind of a competition. Uh, who's older uh, as far as when it comes to composition? Uh, is, it, is it Homer, who obviously is not writing, this is oral tradition, right? Or uh, is it Orpheus? As for his place of birth, where is Orpheus from? Well, the Argonautica from the third century BCE, uh, Polydorus Rhodius says that Orphic himself declared his own origins. He says, thence I made all speed to snowy Thrace. Uh, so he, he is born in Thrace. While as early as the time of Pindar in the sixth century BCE, Orpheus is mentioned. So as early as the sixth century BCE, he is mentioned by name as a participant of the famous expedition of Jason and the Argonauts. You guys ever heard of Jason and the Argonauts? Well, guess what? Orpheus was there in search of what? What was he? In, what, what were they in search of? They're in search of what? Anybody? The Golden Fleece. Thank you. Good, good. Somebody didn't skip the classical reading there, right? <laughs> so what happens? Uh, however, most of the details about the story arise from uh, uh, Rhodius's Argonautica, as I mentioned before, from 240 BCE. Valerius Flaccus. Uh, an anonymous uh, poet from the fourth century CE. 
Uh, now, despite the fact that uh, Orpheus is not known to be endowed with great strength, he certainly had great strength when it came to his lungs. He could sing and he could move mountains. Well, in many cases, he did. <laughs> and uh, he was able with his voice, with his lyre in hand, musical instrument, not fibbing, uh, what happened is the fact that he was able to calm the stormy sea uh, through his music. In fact, uh, uh, he was able to move the ship, the Argos, uh, that could not move, could not budge from the land to the water through his music. He was able to make the dragon that was guarding the golden fleece uh, to fall asleep to his beautiful sound of voice. And of course, um, he was also known to even charm the clashing rocks uh, through his singing ability. So he is a wonderful, amazing singer. He is also a holy man. He's all, in many ways, uh, he is a leader in religious affairs, officiating like a priest with, within very co various contexts. He even does uh, sacrifices. Uh, he inducts his crew in the mysteries of Samothrace, it is said. He performs purification rites at Malaya. His prayers in particular were almost as powerful as his music as it seemed that the gods were listening to him. And they continue to listen to him, as we will see in this story. Okay, uh, beyond all that, uh, inevitably, he is going to have uh, fall, somebody's going to fall in love with him. And of course, we have, of course, the story uh, of his wife. Now, of course, everybody says his name, her name differently. And it's, you know, so you've heard it said, um, Eurydice, right? But, you know, you know, you're looking at the Greek and the C is a kappa, by the way. You guys know that, right? So it is uh, Eurydice or Eurydice. Sorry. <laughs> So, you know, so we'll probably go to Eurydice, if that's okay, <laughs> and not be proper Greek. I hope you don't mind, right? Because, you know, I have the phonetic spelling here, and you guys are going to crack up every time I say her, na her name correctly. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, yeah, good. So what happens is, accordingly, um, uh, there is um, uh, a few stories uh, here that uh, Pausanias, writing in the second century, uh, there is, he describes a painting uh, by a polygonist at Delphi, which was uh, painted between 450 to 420 BCE. And it shows Orpheus present in Hades without his wife. So some people will say there is another story that he doesn't go uh, to fetch his wife. Uh, you know, there's lots of stories, right? But of course, with, yet with that said, uh, there is a relief of, of Orpheus, Eurydice, right? And Hermes dating to around 400 BCE, which is early enough to show that there still was an early established story of his wife within this context. Uh, so who was this wife of Orpheus? Her st stories vary and her name is not always Eurydice. Uh, according uh, to the Alexandrian poet Hermesinex, which is a great name. I'm loving dropping papers here. Oh, there you go. That was my workout for today. I should just keep doing this right there. <laughs> and in fact, the other, okay, there you go. Um, who is this? Um, accordingly, her name was Agrope. Yeah, uh, A-G-R-I-P-E, right? Okay, so, which means wild-eyed. But this is where it gets fun. Her name also means wild-voiced. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. You know, this is, this is the part where I just go, oh, this is good. So wait a second. So, so he has this beautiful melodic voice. And in many cases, he attributed uh, his, his singing and his ability to guess what God Apollo, right? But she has the wild voice. Who's wild? Dionysus, right? So there's many stories where it's like, oh, you got the Apollo, he's the guy, and she's the gal, and they got the Dionysus. So a little bit of order, 
a little bit of chaos, you can see this is going to work out, right? So what happened is, in some version, version, she was actually a nymph from Thrace, and even a dyad, right? Uh, and so was enraptured by his music. And as a result, she fell in love with him, with this mere mortal, and decided to be his wife. Unfortunately, fate played a cruel hand, taking Orpheus' wife way too soon. There's a few stories. One of them is that she's a victim of snake bite. Uh, that's one version of the story. According to Virgil, uh, she was actually fleeing an obsessed and unwanted lover. Yeah, yeah. His name is Arestius. Yes. And then as she's running away, she stepped on this venomous snake. Uh, there is another story, which is very strange. It's been mentioned by Ovid, where it is said that the reason why uh, she dies is because right before their wedding day, uh, she was dancing with naiads. Uh, and uh, these are these, these uh, spirits of mountains, wells, and springs. And I guess apparently that's a little taboo before your wedding. And that was the cause of death. There's lots of stories. I think Ovid is kind of withholding all the content. But, you know, in other words, uh, so many other traditions really do make her almost, if not completely, a goddess. And I'm thinking that's, that's fascinating. Right? We can go places with this one. Okay. Well, he's upset. Orpheus uh, is in pain. Uh, and um, it's one of those moments where he just, he just so upset. Uh, he, just, he just cries out. Uh, he yells, sings. And uh, in fact, uh, his, his uh, voice is plaintive. It's pathetic but it's a beautiful song. This is the most passionate song he's ever sung. It moves people, right? It moves nature. It's like one of those moments, like in a Disney film, right? You know, he's singing and like all the, no, I'm, I'm not joking. All the animals are listening, right? People are hearing from near and far and the gods too, they are listening. Because of this, right? Uh, well, actually, the sound goes so far, it goes into the underworld and moves uh, to the shades and the guardians of the dead. And they, too, were moved by his song. Uh, it was a divine invocation. And so as a, as, a, as a result, it comes to the ear of Hades and Persephone. And he's invited down to Hades. This is interesting. Right? This is a, so he is truly great. If you know, he arrives. Uh, there's you know, Cerberus, you know, the three-headed do uh, dog. Well, um, uh, he he sings. The dog loves the music too. I mean, he's good. He's good, right? Of course, um, what happens now is is that he enters Hades. And, uh, um, you know, uh, he appeals uh, to Hades and Persephone. He says, you know, you guys know this love. You know what it's like to feel love. You know, I've lost my love, which I think is fascinating because from this reference, you realize, hey, Persephone and Hades loved each other. You get that nugget. You go, oh, that's good. I'm going to run with this one, right? Because a lot of people think, you know, you know, hey, she doesn't want to be with the, the dark lord, right? Or the underworld. And it's like, no, no. The fact that he is appealing uh, to the fact that if you found your love, I want to have my love again. So <laughs> what happens is, is that, uh, well, um, you're going to have three versions of the story. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Uh, the Greeks like different versions. The first version, uh, this is not as well known. Orpheus, I like this version though. Orpheus actually succeeds in his mission. And the sweetness of love is renewed again uh, to the flower of spring. They live happily ever after. You like that version? They live happily. Well, who in the world is going to give that version? 
Um, well, Euripides Alistus actually gives that version. And a poet by the name of Hermesmanix. <laughs> Spell that three times. H-E-R-M-E-S-I-A-N-A-X, as I just said. <laughs> so they say they live happily. You know what? I kind of I kind of want to go with that. Wouldn't that be a good version? Yeah. Of course, we wouldn't get anywhere with these stories. So what's the second one? <laughs> the second one uh, Plato talks about is that Orpheus is only permitted to see the ghost of his beloved wife rather than receiving his wife back in flesh and blood. So just, I just, he just gets to see the flesh. The intended lesson meant to demonstrate that the courageous act would have been to join her in death rather than cheat death itself. Here you have a chance to be with your love. Just become a ghost yourself. Become a shade yourself. You know, come on. You know, how heroic are you? You're not going to give your life away. <laughs> you really love her? Okay. That's the second. You want, you want to hear the third version? Yeah. yeah. All right. Third version. Uh, Haiti says, you could take her with you, but whatever you do, you cannot look back. Not at all until you get out into the realm of light. <laughs> so, so that's, so they're walking along and she's behind him. That's part of the agreement. And he gets to the point where he thinks like he doesn't hear her footprints. The worst part, he's just a few feet away from the cave exit and he sees the light. And Hades specifically says that uh, if, once you go out into the light, you can look back. He just can't, he doesn't hear her. So he just glances back for a split second and whoa, just swallowed up. I'm sorry. That's a, you like that one. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So following the, the loss of his wife, Orpheus is, is having prolonged mourning along the, um, the Strymon River. He was in great pain. In fact, um, he is so hurt. In so, one version of the story, he decided to avoid the company of women altogether. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, so in fact, of course, the interesting part is that it says that his entourage, much of it was made up of women who loved his voice. So he's alienating his fans, right? According to the Alexandrian poet, uh, Phonocles, uh, while shunning women, he began to desire men and became credited uh, with uh, starting the idea of homosexual love. Obviously, it's existed long before that, but hey, you know, it, the Greeks are looking for an origin story. So there it is. Now, remember, you got to understand the Greeks, a homosexuality is, is, is pretty cool. So it's not a negative tone. Does that make sense? So, so this is the beginning of that. Either way, it was uh, women that were his undoing. And these, and these stories vary too in different ways. For the playwright, um, Aslechus, um, to me, Morpheus was actually a devoted worshiper of Apollo. Uh, the god of sun and music, as you know, rather than obviously Dionysus, and was described uh, as habitually climbing up the great mountain Pangaeon uh, every morning to worship this Olympian god. After a while, Dionysus becomes a little upset, a little jealous of his solitary devotion to Apollo uh, and the Olympian, Olympian order, which represented, of course, the polar opposite of his realm of wildness and darkness, but you can see then again, uh, why, why he is, you know, a, a, a devotee of Apollo, you could see why he would have problems with Dionysus because remember wild voiced one, you guys understanding this? So he's kind of moving that. What most people don't know uh, is that Mount Pegion is actually known famous for an oracle uh, of Dionysus. So he's really kind of, he's a, he's a forget this oracle of Dionysus, which is on the very mountain. I'm gonna to climb to the very top and worship Apollo. So you can see that is a real insult. So what's gonna happen as a result of this? <laughs> okay, uh, Dionysus is angry. He sets out his maidens, those frenzied female devotees of his mysteries after Orpheus, uh, actually one night, and they proceed to tear him 
limb by limb into tiny little pieces. According to Virgil, specifically because of his poor treatment of the female sex after the death of his wife, a group of women likewise in the bucket frenzy uh, tore him apart. So you have lots of sources for this. So there are lots of tearing going on, right? Just when you thought it was over for Orpheus, right? There is more. You know, you see, there's his body. Well, what was left of it? It remained in Thrace. And the enraged women threw his head and lyre into the Hebros River, where both head and musical instruments continued out to sea and on to the island of Lesbos. The head somehow singing all the way there to Lesbos. Uh, um, uh, Phanocles says that the lesbians buried the head uh, and the writer Lucian seems to confirm the story, discussing the great temple of Bacchus on the site. So, you know, hey, you know, so Orpheus came out ahead. Okay, so, uh, sorry. <laughs> All right. It's going to rain now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yet, we have yet another tradition. You thought that was it. There's another tradition that the head was not at first actually buried at Lesbos but became a famous oracle telling prophecies for those willing to hear. It became a, literally a talking head, giving prophecies. The fifth century BC Greek vases, and even Philostratus as late as the third century CE confirmed the story of the dismembered prophesying head. After a while, Apollo becomes a little bit jealous, a little upset about this, and the head ceases to speak. And perhaps at this point, we got a burial at Lesbos. Is this, you guys got it? So this is Orpheus. You feel like you know him pretty well now? Maybe, maybe not. Well, now of all these tales, there's lots of tales. There's, there's lot, but there's, there's complicated theogonies. Uh, Hesiod ha articulates uh, uh, a theogony as well uh, that's connected uh, to the Orphic mysteries. Uh, but uh, it is clear that there's lots of embellishments. But what will happen eventually uh, is the classic Orphic myth. Now I'm looking before here, I have the summary but written by Walter Burkert. I'm not gonna read it. I'm just gonna say it in my own words, right? But the idea is, is that we're of many sources for the central Orphic myth. Uh, and uh, you have to follow kind of closely. So you gotta catch it. So here it goes. Of course, this is uh, the myth pertaining to Dionysus, uh, Zagreus. So basically what happens is, is that you're going to have Zeus. We all love Zeus, right? You know, and he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very celibate god. Keeps to himself, does not do anything that's improper whatsoever. Okay, no, that's not it. So, so with Zeus, what he does uh is he um, i'm gonna use king james english because i think it makes it sound like nicer than it really is uh so um so he goes unto demeter uh and abducts her and uh gets her pregnant and she bears persephone then he goes unto persephone gets her pregnant with Dionysus. You guys got it? Now you're going, this is awful already. <laughs> you know, I feel uncomfortable, Dr. Rita. <laughs> I think I'm going to leave now. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so the idea is, is that Dionysus is supposed to be mostly Zeus stuff. And Zeus is connected uh, in the Orphic Mysteries with the realm of spirit. He is the realm of the spiritual realm uh, in a sense, purity, believe it or not, just by its substance, not what he does, right? So how do you get uh, a mostly Zeus kind of creation? You do this. Is that making sense? Okay, so so you got Dionysus. You know, who's going to be mad about this, though? Who's going to be mad about Zeus doing this? Who always gets mad? Who should be mad? Hera, right? Hera gets upset, you know, and I'm sure Zeus is like, hey, this is no big deal. You know, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, so Hera, what she does is she finds these titans, 
you know, to find them. She <laughs> and these Titans, you got to understand, these Titans are understood. It's a very strange thing. Are Titans spiritual? Yes, they are. Are they material? Yes, they are. Does that make sense? You go, how can you have something that's full, spiritual and material at the same time? Welcome uh, to the Greek uh, mythological background of how they think. And sometimes you have things that don't make any sense. But this is the reality. So there are material spirit stuff that is heavy, that is dark, uh, that is evil, right? These titans are believed to be evil. You guys got it so far? So she's going to bring these titans. And what will happen uh, is, is that uh, there is the uh, throne room and uh, and Zeus is saying kind of crazy stuff like, you know, hey, you know what? After me, since you're mostly like me, you're going to be the successor. That doesn't go very well with the other gods. I don't think so. So what will happen is, is, is Hera has these titans. They give the kid a mirror, which is kind of strange. And they have all these toys. I, I'm serious. There are toys in this story. And little baby Dionysus starts playing the to with the toys. And, and little baby Dionysus then kind of goes out, uh, lured out of the throne room. And then what do they do? The Titans take him. And they cut him up into little, well, actually, yeah, they cut him in little pieces. They roast him and they eat him. Boy, you guys are loving this story. Isn't this great? <laughs> I know. You know, okay, so you're going, wow, this story is really going downhill. I know. <laughs> it's, is it going to get worse? No, it's going to get better. Okay, so what's going to happen now? Well, now you've got these titans that have in, uh, they are material, evil uh, uh, beings, and they have in their belly pure spirit, good Dionysus. Got it? So you got this duality going on here. This is going to be interesting. Zeus, he's, at, he's angry. He's upset. He's got those lightning bolts, right? Boom. Shoots it at those titans. Turns them into crispy critters, right? They're just all crispy. They're all mixed up. And there's various stories, various versions of these stories. I'll give you the one that will make more sense when we, because we're going to be talking about uh, the details of the Orphic Mysteries in a few seconds. Ooh, this is kind of cool, right? And that is, you got the evil little particle ash, and you got the good Dionysian, right, uh, spirit. Puts them together and makes humanity. Oh, now we got it. So humanity has a titanic evil flesh and a good Dionysian spirit. Oh, are we getting my point now? This is how it happens, right? Ugly story, but now we are we now entered into the, the threshold uh, of the uh, of the Orphic mysteries. You know, we're getting there, and that is okay. So so all of us have you know have a good spirit if it's recognized that comes from above and we have that's a dionysian spirit but we also have an evil titanic flesh that you that we have to fight and so what this does in the sixth into the fifth centuries uh what it does is it changes the battlefield in a big way in religion it's because remember before the fight against evil good and evil is out there right it's out there you know it's a showcase you can see that in society right good guys bad guys it's exteriorized well now that battle has moved from outside to inside and the battle is for your soul got it it's now it's an internal battle wait this is interesting so that means you have an evil titanic flesh and a good spirit. There's a battle, eternal battle. Hey, this kind of goes into uh, later aspects of Hellenistic Judaism and, oh, Christianity. Yeah, but this is 500 years earlier. So are you seeing where we're going? This is setting up the backdrop for some of these ideas being introduced in there. Okay, so 
in this myth, myth, <laughs> in this myth, the human condition is divided between a div divine Dionysian spirit, as I said, an evil titanic flesh. This repressive titanic nature of man was proverbial, expressing an innate evil or chaotic nature that, according to Plato, is exhibited in disobedience to authorities, to parents, to laws. This, this evil soma, this body was uh, considered a sema of the soul. It was considered the tomb of the soul. This body is the tomb of the soul, the sepulcher. The followers of Orpheus uh, gave this name specifically to the body because the soul is punished for that which is punished. It seems to have this the reason for this is it seems to have this covering. Uh, in fact, uh, likeness, our flesh is in the likeness of a prison and that we have to be kept. It says, um, um, so is a tie. We have to be kept in custody until uh, it or our debt has been paid in full. Now, this is interesting. A debt. So wait, we got a soul and it's and we're in a body that is the sepulcher of the soul uh it is the tomb of the soul and we're there because we have sinned and uh we're there because they're a debt boy that even that also sounds like christianity does not does not doesn't it or is it just me once again this is five four hundred years before christianity okay this is why if you go to the catacombs of rome sometimes you're going to see the image of Jesus in the catacombs, and they draw him like Orpheus. Did you guys know that? Yeah, you're learning things, right? And remember, you're going, oh, but is this a problem? No, it's not a problem. Uh, I, I think it's fascinating. I want to go here just for a few seconds because I'm going to talk a little bit about Christianity. But, I, you know, I think the problem is, the difficulty is, uh, whether you're a person who ha does, does not have a faith or a faith system, it doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is I want you to know what's going on historically. In ancient times in the first century, they didn't care where the truth came from because the truth is truth everywhere. You guys got that? It can come from a pagan source. That was okay. But they would say that it was corrupted. They would say it was corrupted. It's not pure. Well, who in the world would say that? Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria. Ignatius of Antioch, Tertullian. Oh, you're getting my point. You guys ever heard of Augustine? You're waking up now. You're wait a minute. The problem is nowadays we don't we don't like innovation. We don't like if you know the the idea is is that hey you know if somebody uh, you know if somebody uh, thought of well, actually you know well the idea is this we we don't like the idea that if somebody thought of it before and it's in our belief system, then it must not be as true. It must be less true. For the ancient mind, it was because other people believed it's true within their belief system, it validated their beliefs and perspectives. This is why you're gonna have the Magi for heaven's sakes, seeing Jesus, who are, who are they? They're the priests of Zoroastrianism. Everybody knew that in the first century. Is this making sense? So I just wanna make it very clear that early Christianity would say, you know, somebody came up to somebody uh, in ancient, you know, ancient times uh, um, to an ancient Christian say, hey, you know, these beliefs sound just, just like orphism. They would say, yeah, isn't that great? Right, isn't that cool? Yeah, truth is truth everywhere. Yeah, see, God's truth prevails even in other belief systems. Today we go, oh no, <laughs> it's gonna erode our faith, help me. Is that making sense? You guys got it? So we almost have to go into an ancient mind perspective because we're gonna we're gonna hear some doozies in a little bit. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So furthermore, where are we now? Oh yeah, I, I think I was talking something really positive about the, the soul and uh, being uh, what in, in a prison. That's our body. Is, is that the last half full kind of thing I was talking about? Okay, they also call a prison house. Wow, this is pretty. Or an enclosure, parabolus, right? Uh, in, in the Plato states concerning this Soma Sema, he says, I should not be surprised if Euripides 
speaks truly when he says, who knows whether life is death and death life. So that in reality, perhaps we are in a state of death. I myself once heard one of the wise men say that in the present life, we are dead and the body is our tomb, unquote. And of course, he's referring to, Plato's referring to those who believe the Orphic Mysteries. A fragment of Philolus, uh, quoted by the Christian Clement of Alexandria, echoes this idea centuries later when he states, the ancient theologians and seers bear witness that owing to certain sins, the soul is yoked with and buried in the body as in the tomb. This is used by a Christian apologist, for heaven's sakes, and he's using the Orphic Mysteries as substantiating this idea. Is that making sense? Yeah. Okay, according to Orphism, this soul originates from the heavens and is indeed divine, being a particle. And I'm using the word particle intentionally. It sounds like modern thought. No, it's a particle of the pure amphorium substance or this e uh, ether, a particula divine ore. Yes, it is a particle. It's interesting. So we have a spark. We have a particle of divinity in us, this purity. Uh, one Orphic fragment says, from heaven is my descent, as you yourself know also. For I too claim to be of your blessed race. As for each person, they are, quote, a child of earth and starry heaven. So we are a child of earth. That's our titanic nature. And we are of starry heaven. That's our Dionysian nature. So we have two natures, right? We have this uh, sin, flesh, uh, material nature, and we have this uh, sinless uh, uh, divine spirit uh, nature as well. Okay, in contrast uh, to the human body, which is of the earth, the soul is rooted in the celestial element. Uh, it is also said, hence, before entering, I'm, I'm, I'm just reading ancient, I love this. I told you when I, when I write these talks, what I do is I do the primary sources first. Isn't that great? I find all the primary sources and I, and I put that in order and then I layer over the secondary sources. So that's why you hear lots of quotes. So half the time that I'm, I'm reading these notes, I'm reading their words about their own belief. Cool, huh? Yeah, it kind of adds a little bit. So here it is. Before entering for the first time into a corporal tabernacle, each particular soul would seem to have lived in the society of the gods and was in fact a god. Empedocles speaks of souls incarnate as daemons, not demons, compelled by necessity, uh, necessity's decree to wander from the abode of the blessed. He himself says, an exile and a wanderer from heaven. Now, wait, so wait, so wait, so we were compelled uh, to be in exile from the starry realm. Now, that's interesting. What is going on here? Don't worry. We're going to go places. <laughs> okay. So you thought that this was, 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 wasn't strange enough? You guys ready? Okay. According, uh, according to Empedocles, some particles of the divine ether sink downward to the earth where they become clothed. Empedocles says, in a strange garment of flesh. Aristotle also talks about this as well. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and he also says that in the so-called Orphic verses, he says, the soul was said to be carried to and fro by the winds and drawn into the body by respiration. You're going, I'm going to read it again. I don't let this sink in. The soul was said to be carried to and fro by the winds and drawn into the body by respiration. Wait, what is that? In other words, uh, this idea uh, is called panspermesis. Panspermesis soul seeds soul seeds 
are swarming everywhere. Right? Soul seeds are, are you know, floating about, ready to rush into the body as soon as the baby takes his or her first breath. And that's where the soul enters into the person. Is that interesting? So the spirit is out there. And as soon as, you know, the baby comes out of the womb and goes, you know, maybe it's pad, it's, it's, it's bottom, right? And it goes, ah, you know, what happens there? It's whoo, first breath. That's where the soul comes from. Not before. This is, a, this is a major Greek idea. By the way, if you're familiar with Jewish thought, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of this also within Jewish thought. That it also starts with the idea of breath, ruha, with the breath of life. Does that make sense? Upon birth. This is Jewish thought, not Christian thought, but Jewish thought. Is this interesting? So this is an ancient idea. So you can use the word pans for missus now. You know, hey, you believe in pans for missus. <laughs> okay. So now what happens is, however, uh, you know, it's interesting. So I guess you got to watch out, you know, maybe it was going to be raining today. We're getting pams for missus, you know, watch out. So there'll be, there'll be babies born in St. Jude's over here, getting their souls. Okay. So <laughs> stopping now quickly. Uh, however, uh, the originating uh, reason for the soul's descent is sin. And its imprisonment in the body has a penitentiary purpose in many ways. Uh, that's, that seems kind of like kind of negative, doesn't it? Sin. But sin is also understood as chaos. And the universe has is in the chaotic, because you know, there are different words for sin. There's three words for sin. It can also be the Tony Ross sin, which is of course is the evil sin, you know. But you know, and you have the harmatia kind of sin, that's the missing the mark sin. Uh, and then of course, uh, you're gonna have the kakos, you know, as a cacophony, you know, which is the chaotic sin and so this kind of has there's almost a chaotic feel to it because it mentions the wind blowing it to and fro so there's chaos to it so the nature has some aspect of chaos and yes we're going to be talking about where that comes from too is this good you guys are, okay you guys following all right so he talks in the course the, the flesh uh of course uh, uh, to one who is flesh from the spacious atmosphere of heaven the world in which we live appears to be a cave roofed over by the sky a cave roofed over by the sky we live uh in a cave roofed over and of course you can't help but think about plato's story about the cave right is that making sense so you see there's there's connections here all right uh Epidocle says i wept and i wailed when i beheld the unfamiliar place the joyless region where murder and wrath and troops of other dooms and loathsome diseases and putrefications and running sores wander this way and that throughout the meadow of Ati. Wow. <laughs> Empedocles really made my day, right? So, so he, you know, he say, ah, you know, when I arrived in this realm, it's chaotic, you know, pestilence, right? Maybe pandemic, right? You know, there's, there's, there's chaos here. After this, we're not done with the fasting bits and pieces. After this, the soul is enclosed in the flesh, and it becomes part of what the Orphics call the circle or the wheel of generation. They also call it the circle of necessity. Uh, this is the long and weary circuit of birth and death <laughs> in which we travel. In fact, it's, it is birth, life, death, and rebirth. It's like, whoa. So, Gnosis, right? The idea here is, is that uh, they actually literally use the idea of rebirth. It is rebirth. So, uh, so what happens, Empedocles and Plato uh, talks about this in the Phaedrus. And so we're going to go for, according to the Orphic uh, mysteries, we're going to live thrice 10,000 seasons, thrice 10,000 seasons, which is approximately 10,000 years. So we're going to be stuck in this abode going through birth, life, death, rebirth, birth, 
you know, life, death, rebirth. We're going to be doing this uh, pretty much for the next 10,000 years. Woohoo, right? That seems kind of depressing. What do you think? Yeah, you don't want to do this. Does anybody want to do this? Don't you want to get out of here? Yeah, That's right. And what does Orpheus say? I have a way out of here. You do? Yes. And I'll tell you how at the end of this talk. I'll tell you how you can get supposedly get out of here. You guys ready for that? I have the secret. So, you know, you could be here, you know, for just a few hundred years or less, and you're out of here. So, and that's what gave the Orphic Mysteries uh, so much appeal, right? You know, you want to, to go to heaven. You want to be released. You want to go to the Isles of the Blessed. You want to go and be free. And this, and so this is the handy dandy guide of how they did this. Okay, so um, during this time, the exiled soul, <laughs> more good news uh, from Empedocles, it wanders from the home of the blessed, being born into all kinds of mortal forms, passing from one laborious path of life to another. For the mighty air chases him into the sea, and the sea spits him forth upon the dry land, and the earth casts him into the light of the blazing sun, and the sun hurls him into the eddies of air. Wow, <laughs> violent elements, right? One takes him from the other, and he is hated of them all. I also am one of these, an exile and a wanderer from the gods. So, so the soul can be born into many bodies. And Empedocles states, he says, air now. I too have been a boy. I have been a girl. I have been a bush. I have been a bird and a scaly fish in the sea. So right there, you have the answer when it comes to souls. You know, you reincarnate, male and female, doesn't matter, uh, but also fish, animal, whatever. It's going to happen. The soul then goes through, during this time, a purification process. If we're doing what is right in our actions, which sounds like karma, doesn't it, right? We do what is right in our actions. When we go through this wheel of birth, life, death, and and rebirth, hopefully you'll be becoming more spiritual and moving up as you go along. Because if you don't, then you're going to go the other way. You know, if you're doing bad things, birth, life, death, and rebirth, you'll start with every lifetime getting lower and lower and lower. Does that make sense? That really, to me, sounds like samsara, and that sounds like Hinduism to me. And yet, it is in the Greco-Roman beliefs and orphism. So we definitely have connections between East and West. But people say, hey, there's no connection between Greece and India. Where are you getting this from? <laughs> right? Is this making sense? And we do know that we have, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, many sources talk about Indian uh, gymnosophists are those of the Indic philosophy uh, coming uh, to Greece, coming to Ro Rome. In fact, one advocate of the Indic uh, of, of belief system uh, he burned himself alive at the Olympic Games before everybody uh, during the 130s. So this is front page news. Everybody knows about reincarnation. Everybody knows about India. Who doesn't know about it? We don't know about it now in the 21st century. But that's common knowledge then. Does that make sense? In fact, there, there's a section of Alexandria where it had a whole bunch of people from India living there. And of course, you know, many of Sakis, uh, who was the founder uh, of Neoplatonism because he was the teacher um, of, of Plotinus. He was half Indian, for heaven's sakes. Is this actually? And Sakas means Sakyas, which of course is the clan of Buddha. Is that making sense? You guys getting this? Common knowledge. And I spent a lot of time in the ancient sources and I see it everywhere. If you're very interested, that would be a good talk because I would love to talk about uh, India uh, and Greece and Rome. In fact, I had done talks on that at Cal State Fullerton. So, you know, this is taken seriously. Okay, moving along. So you're going through a purification process. Uh, so it sounds kind of me like a purgatoria to me, doesn't it? You know, as we go through all this, right? Okay. And so we're gonna have, of course, uh, more quotes, you know. Uh, so here we go. Uh, pure I came from the pure, O queen of the dwellers of the underground. 
So there you have it, purification. The followers of the Orphic Mysteries made themselves pure through a, a number of techniques, a number of, of strategies. Uh, one, of course, is, um, you know, abstinence. <laughs> you know, because you're making more material things. So that's one way. Not eating animal flesh was a big one. Empedocles states, do you not see that in the, the thoughtlessness of your hearts, you are devouring one another? Because if you're eating, according to the, those of the Orphic Mysteries, uh, if you're eating flesh, this flesh was once endowed with a soul, with a spirit. So you're kind of, what about the, what about the plants? Oh, I mean, so, <laughs> so keep on going, right? Uh, also, for some strange reason, I actually know the reason, beans were forbidden. No beans. And that is because it, it traps the substance of the air. It's entrapped. This is a violation. What does beans make you do? That's right. Uh, yeah, flagellants. So obviously they must be cursed. In fact, uh, a, a Pythagoras, Pythagoras died because he's running away from those who are trying to kill him and he wouldn't run across the bean field. And he stopped. Look it up. <laughs> You'll see it. And that's how he died. No beans. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no wearing woolen garments either. Uh, eggs were forbidden by some sources. So there you have it. Uh, but uh, a lot of those, the Orphic Mysteries, who said, you know, this is purely symbolic. You know, they'll, you know, they'll take it as, as, as you know, there's, there's symbols, but we can't live this way. <laughs> so, so you're going to have that as well. And that's talked about. Uh, you know, because they want to show that they're really, they're really indifferent to the world. That's what they say. Well, we're really indifferent to the world. So I'm going to go ahead and do those things anyway, because I just don't care. Right. So, so I'm detaching myself from the material world. And sometimes that means staying away from things, or that means that's not, not thinking too much of those things. You know, I'm not going to obsess about it, think about it too much. Uh, Plato uh, had lots of complaints. Uh, he, he likes Orphism quite a bit in certain times because he, he uses their methodologies and ideas a lot. But other times, uh, he doesn't like the fact that there is a class of them uh, who are just all into profiteering. You know, they're charlatans, they're, they're, they're magicians. So there's like a, a cast of them that, that, that caused a problem. He states, uh, these priests and soothsayers visit the gates of the rich to persuade them that they have acquired from the gods by means of sacrifices and charms the powers to heal with pleasures and festal rites whatever sin has been committed by a man himself or by his ancestors ah interesting so there's the idea of sin that comes from your fathers or your father's fathers you know they have this this power they also provide us with a heap of books bearing the names of Musius and Orpheus, sons, we are assured, of the moon and the muses, liturgies by which they sacrifice, persuading not only private individuals, but also cities that there are ways of absolution and purifications from sin by means of sacrifices and joyous pleasures, both during life and also after death, through what they call the mystic rites, which delivers us from the wrath to come. Oh, there's a wrath to come, right? Uh, but dreadful is the doom awaiting those who have not sacrificed. So say, hey, you know, there's, there's the wrath to come, but you can be saved, right? Oh, this is interesting. Right? They're preaching, right? They're, they're, they're preaching to, you know, they're, they're not being quiet, right? They're preaching to the various cities. What I find is interesting here, there's so much, is the idea, of, he says it twice, pleasures or joyous pleasures, What's that about? Well, we discovered that those who follow the Orphic Mysteries do enjoy life. It's not all about self-abnegation. Oh, I love that word, right? It's, it's all about in enjoying life still, right? And, you know, and things can be all about celebration. So the, those who follow the Orphic Mysteries are about music, you know, singing, dancing. Uh, so there is that kind of joy. Is that, and you see that also within certain sects, especially in Hinduism, you know, the various festivities and so forth, you know, that kind of joyous aspect. Okay, there we go. Okay, so, my, but there are some correlations with Christianity. You, you did notice this, right? Some correlations here. Um, 
Uh, of course, we have the duality between spirit and flesh. You know, the Apostle Paul, right? You know, the ideas, I buffet my body, make it a slave in order to serve, in order to save, you know? So you have this idea that the, that the flesh is evil, the spirit is good. You have also the inward and divinely inspired goodness within the person in opposition to an inborn evil nature stemming from wicked beings, whether the Titans or Satan, right, and his demons. You also have an afterlife with rewards and punishments. So, I mean, there's just quite a bit here. And again, remember, this belief system uh, is, uh, I say, five to 400 years before Christianity because it's developing in the 500s or the 400s BCE. So, it, you know, got to give that chance there. But yeah, it's, it's earlier. But again, early Christians would say, yeah, so what? <laughs> it's still part of the development of these ideas. Concerning the dismemberment of Dionysus, and you know we're going to go here, right? Uh, Plutarch uh, says a few things here. He says, it would perhaps not be wrong to begin and quote lines from Empedocles as a preface. For here he says allegorically that souls paying the penalty for murders and the eating of flesh and cannibalism are imprisoned in mortal bodies. However, it seems that this account is even older for the legendary suffering of dismemberment told about Dionysus and the outrages of the Titans on him and their punishments and their being blasted with lightning after having tasted the blood. This is all a myth in its inner hidden meaning about, and he says, I mean, the ancient source about reincarnation. Wait, who says reincarnation? Oh, Wow, he's uh, Plutarch who's quoting Empedocles. Is this interesting? So they, they do talk about reincarnation. For that in us, which is irrational and disorderly and violent and not divine but demonic, the ancients used to name the Titans. And the myth is about being punished and paying the penalty. Uh, Plutarch argues in this work that to consume meat is unnatural to our true selves and part of the inferior titanic materiality tethered to us, arguing that we are not even equipped with the proper eating physical characteristics that are evident in other meat eating animals. I know there's a lot of vegetarianism going on here. So sorry, but these are, uh, this is their belief system, right? As you see also uh, within many branches of, of Hinduism. Uh, Plutarch also says, we are to look to eat that which Dionysus produces for us. So you ba basically have a Dionysian diet. Right? So it's like, hey, you know what? You know, what are you supposed to eat? Well, okay, so what does Dionysus persuade? You know, of course you have like lots of, you know, Dionysus is the, is the god of wine. You just sit around and drink lots of wine. Actually, there is something to that. <laughs> we'll get there. In fact, I'll read some inscriptions. Uh, they're, they're, even when you get to heaven, you get a glass of wine. You guys know that, right? I'll read it to you. You'll love this. So wine is important, but the idea is fruits and vegetables and grains and so forth, right? So it's that kind of diet. So there it is. Uh, with everything, the dismemberment of Dionysus also connects with the agricultural cycles of the vine. So there it goes. Uh, the fruit of the vine, uh, the idea is that uh, it's considered twice born. Uh, so you have, of course, you have the, uh, the vine, which is the firstborn, and each individual grape, that's the second born, that's the second birth. And that's, and of course, the idea is, is that the idea is that we come from this vine and, uh, and we will enjoy or have a new birth, right? And there's, of course, a connection here uh, to reincarnation. Uh, so it's the idea, and of course, even, even have ideas uh, that connect to the idea of, of transitioning uh, from um, uh, the idea of turning water uh, into wine, which is a fascinating thing. In fact, it's so interesting because if you look at the Gospel of John, it talks about who Jesus is. And it says in Greek, it says that, that Jesus, after the, the miracle of Cana, of turning the water into, in, into wine, it says, it basically says, it does say, it says Jesus uh, is the vine, the true one. Wait, what? well, that's kind of weird. Now, of course, in English, they translate it as Jesus is the true vine. That, that's not what it says. It says Jesus is the vine, and then it goes, and the definite article, the true one. 
What does that mean? As opposed to the false one. So this is was actually a comparison in the Gospel of John to the Dionysian rites. Does that make sense? And just like the Dionysian rites, the idea that Jesus is promising a rebirth. You guys got that? So, so those people who knew the Dionysian belief system, the Orphic Mysteries, they're reading this passage. Oh, I understand that. But today we go, I have no clue. <laughs> what does this mean? Is this helpful? So this context is important in many ways. Okay, so the idea of metempsychosis. Metempsychosis sounds like something's wrong with you. Well, it has to do with the transmigration of the soul is often identified with the Pythagoreans. And, and of course, obviously, Marx's Orphism in many ways. Uh, it characterizes the followers of Orpheus as believers in a life after death, right? So you have that. I'm looking at my time here. To kill any living thing was as scathing as committing suicide, they would say. Followers of Orphism avoided meat, as I said, animal products. And even though the central myth of Orphism was Dionysic, uh, there is a difference between the Dionysian mysteries and the Orphic mysteries. You know, what's the difference between the Dionysian mysteries and the Orphic mysteries? Well, the Dionysian mysteries, they actually oppose one another. The central right for the Dionysian mysteries is the Bacchic Orgia, which is the intentional dismembering and eating of an animal. And they would eat this animal raw in their frenzy. Wait a second. <laughs> The Orphics don't believe in eating meat, right? So you could see that they're going to say, no way, we're not doing this. So for them, they, they see this dismemberment as a symbol for after all, baby Dionysus was torn up by the Titans, right? And he's sacred. So their commentary is, no, this is terrible. We don't, we don't do this. This is part of the story. It's a sacred story. And it's for, for what we're not supposed to do. You got it? So they are polar opposite from one another, even though they participate in these ideas. Okay. I, I, for a few seconds, because yeah, I want to get to the, some of the tablets, but for a few seconds, I want to go into details about their, their theogony before Zeus, if you don't mind, because it, it's, it's, it's interesting. Okay. So what happens basically uh, in the Orphic tradition tells a very interesting story of how the world began. Originally, there is this unsaid, it's not told about, it's kind of kept quiet, it's supposed to be a mystery, the source that we don't know. And the source that we don't know creates water and earth, these two elements, water and earth, according to Damascius. Originally, we have hydros, water, he, Orpheus says, and mud from which uh, Gaia, or Gaia, the earth, solidified. You know, so you got water and you got earth, the one before the other. And then what happens is the two together create, even though you have a shadowy you know, first one that we don't talk about, Shh, don't tell anybody. The third principle after the two was engendered by these two. So by water and earth, what is created? This, you're going to be fascinated. A serpent. What? A serpent is created, comes out of this mud of earth and water. It's a serpent, Drakon, with, an, with extra heads growing upon it. He has one has a head of a bull and a head of a lion and a god's countenance in the middle so there's a god in the middle and you got these two it's kind of scary huh right it had wings upon its shoulder and its name was chronos but it's it's it's, it's with the um it's with the uh, the he uh and which is unaging time and uh this this god is paired with a nunki a-N-A-N-K-E, Ananki. Boy, that sounds so Mesopotamian, doesn't it? Anyway, Ananki, which is inevitability or compulsion, also known as Adrastia. So you have the, 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 the serpent, uh, Kronos, with Adrastia or Anankia. Uh, and, of course, it is said that uh, 
uh, as a result of this connection, they create light, they create air, and they create dampness. Okay. From there, then Kronos with Anankia taking the light and air and darkness, having within them the water and earth. I know. Uh, they lay an egg. What? They lay an egg. And this egg is divided into a masculine and feminine. How this works uh, is, is that the serpent coils around this egg and splits it into two. And one part goes up towards the heavens. That's Uranus. And the other, that becomes heavenly or spirit. And the other drops down to the earth. And that is Gaia. You guys got it? Then they together, they create Protogonus or Zeus. And that's how it comes together. Isn't that interesting? So that's how the theogony. And then, of course, we know the rest of the story. So um, I wanted to make sure uh, that we caught that. All right. So um, I don't want to spend too much time uh, talking about um, uh, there's so many good things here. Uh, well, maybe for later. Um, I'm happy it's not raining yet, though. Good. I got to watch it. I got to watch it, right? <laughs> okay, you do have the Orphic hymns. Um, I like to read the Orphic hymns, but um, I don't have a lot. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm tempted. I'll read, I'll read a couple. So Orphic hymns uh, date later than the Homeric hymns roughly from the third century BCE to the second century CE. I like the Orphic hymn to Athena. It goes, only begotten, noble race of Zeus, blessed and fierce, who joyous in caves to rove, O warlike Pallas, whose illustrious kind, ineffable and effable we find, magnanimous and famed, the rocky height and groves and shady mountains the delight. In arms rejoicing, who with furies dire and wild the souls of mortal dust inspire, gymnastic virgin of terrific mind. I like gymnastic. I love that. Whoever translated this, it's like, what, doing acrobatics? Right? Uh, dire gorgons, bane, unmarried, blessed, kind, mother of the arts, uh, impetuous, understood as fury by the bad, but wisdom by the, by the good. Female and male. Oh, that's interesting, right? Female and male, the arts of war are thine. Oh, much form, Draconia, sea dragon. Inspired divine over uh, the uh, Phlegarian giants, roused to ire thy uh, courses, driving with destructive drive. Tritagania, uh, which is, of course, you know, uh, splendid mean, perjurer of evils, even says uh, blue eyed maid. This is fascinating. This has echoes of an earlier form of Athena, an earlier form than the one we're used to. And how you can tell the difference is Athena oftentimes has gray eyes. When she's described as blue eyes, she is, she is the daughter of Poseidon. <sighs> And we're going back to the Minoans and the Mycenaeans and the early, early uh, factor where Poseidon was the great ruler and not Zeus. Is this fascinating? So this goes back a little ways. I won't read the ones to Demeter. I just, I, I just got to give you an example of these kinds of hymns. Okay. Uh, Pythagoras, of course, was considered or connected uh, to the worship of the Orphic, uh, of Orpheus. And I have tons of fun stuff here. And I'll just say, this will be the quickest bit on Pythagoras ever. I would just say that the disciples revered him as a demigod. Uh, he, uh, he is believed to have special powers over nature and the animal world. Uh, and um, uh, he had powers of discernment. Pythagoras emphasized that each of us possessed a unique soul that could proceed through these multiple rebirths and finally liberation. Pythagoras, of course, talks about that our soul has three parts, intelligence, reason, and passion. Uh, Pythagoras teaches about 
the wheel of birth. He does talk about it, which is which, of course, in fact, in, in many, many regards, everything that I talked about, uh, the, the ideas of the Orphic mysteries, Pythagoras believed. So he is uh, considered in many ways one of the founders, but I want to keep hurrying along because I'm stubborn because I have to get to the good stuff. Because, you know, you guys are stuck here. And, and, and maybe you want to um, maybe you want to get out of here, right? So how do we get out of this, uh, you know, being here 10,000 years, right? I mean, how do we do it? You know? So here's a handy dandy guide of just how to do it. Orphism has golden tablets. No, and they're real golden tablets. They have discovered golden tablets everywhere of devotees to Orpheus. Um, where did it start out? Well, they first found them in Southern Italy. And so what they would do is, is they had, you have your urn with it has the ashes in it and they have uh, the little, you know, uh, little, you know, the gold, gold tablet that's, that's rolled and stuck in there with your ashes. Uh, it spread to Sicily and then it spread to Thessaly and then eventually got to Crete. And so the idea is uh, this is a guide for you to uh, get out of uh, this world, get out of reincarnation and go to the starry realm above or the Isles of the Blessed. This gives you directions. I'm going to give you directions. I'm going to give you magic words to use, right? Here we go. So here we go. All right. So according uh, to, um, I'll just skip that. So what, what happens? Make sure I have this here. Oh, am I missing a page? Oh, no. The divine mysteries will never be known. Is the page missing? I think the page is actually missing. That's okay. We will survive. I have more. Sorry. <laughs> I'm worried you guys are going to. It's like, it's like, it's like, and so the, it's, it's like one of those moments like, I have here the answer to the meaning of life. It is. I'm just joking. No, I, like, I want to keep it in. It's funny. Okay. Okay. So what happens is this. Um, you're going to have these golden tablets. And according to the Hipponian and Polina gold tablets, Dionysus was indeed a central figure connected to the salvation of the soul. Both the Polina tablets in the second line declare, tell Persephone, that Bacchios himself or Dionysus has released you. In addition, three bone tablets from Olbia along the Black Sea also testify to Dionysus as their focus in relation to the afterlife, dedicated to Dio along with the Orphicoi. The gold and bone tablets in general also constantly refer to a duality of child of earth and child of heaven, of body and of soul, of war and peace, of justice and truth. And again, uh, emphasizing the duality of Orphism. In general, here it goes, according to these tablets, as the soul descends, many of the tablets instruct the soul to keep clear, you gotta, you gotta know this, you gotta keep clear of the first spring that you reach. Don't drink from the water of the first spring that you reach. This is the waters of lathe. These are the waters of forgetfulness. If you drink of these waters, you will forget your past life or past lives, and you will be immediately reincarnated. Okay? We, you know, even Virgil, and his Aeneid mentions this, you know, 
You know, he mentions the fact that as you kind of go, you know, you're judged by Persephone uh, and Hades, or in his case, the great judges, there are three. And you can go to the left, uh, which is Tartarus, or you can go to the right, uh, which is, or, or, the, or obviously is Lysium. And of course, the idea is, is that you are there in total between lifetimes for a thousand years. Uh, and then, of course, what will happen is if you're in Tartarus, of course, pain, torture, uh, fire and brimstone, pouring molten lead down your throat, pretty fun. Uh, but sometimes if you're not too bad, you kind of get transferred over to, uh, uh, to uh, Elysium, you know, because it depends on how bad. They call this area, this purification, Purgatoria. You guys ever heard of that? So what happens, though, is this after a thousand years have passed, so long may their penances last, I'm quoting, right? Uh, you'll have lathe of the Lathian flood driving them out of the neighborhood, uh, out of the realm of Elysium, out of the realm of Tartarus, and dries them to the waters of Lathe, where they drink from the waters. And once they do that, they are born again. They live again. And so uh, you're going to have, um, in the Aeneid, uh, you're going to have uh, th them saying, hey, look right there. There is, uh, there is your progeny. There's your Julian progeny. Look, that person's going to be Julius Caesar. He's drinking from that water, that soul. Uh, look, that person's going to be Augustus Caesar. Are you guys following me? So they really believe this. So, so when you die, <laughs> uh, go to the waters of Lake. Forget the first spring. Stay away. So where do you go? Right? Well, uh, what happens is you go to the next spring. And of course, this is uh, minosamine. Minosamine. Uh, is uh, minosinine like mnemonic, like a mnemonic memory? Minosinine, uh, that spring uh, is the spring of memory. So you got to go to minosinine. Uh, it is, uh, I'm going to tell you where it's located. Most of the tablets say that it is on the right side of Hades. So you got to bear right. Although one tablet says uh, you had left. <laughs> you know, hey, you know, these things happen. The copy is messed up. You know, whatever. Uh, so you can see there's some problems there. And of course, this is a spring that is connected to the goddess of memory. Uh, and uh, they refer to the fact that she is the one uh, that, uh, that it's like wax in her heads. That uh, when, you know, when, you, when you experience things, she is like the wax and, and, and what is written in all your memories. That lasts forever. So what will happen is you're gonna you're gonna drink of these waters, and you're going to remember all your past lives. And if you remember all your past lives, you don't reincarnate anymore. You're out of here. Well, we're not done yet. It's not that easy. There's more. Don't worry. So what happens from there? Is that is it okay? So now, uh, of course, you're gonna have um, okay. Uh, so this is so good. Um, okay, according to funerary inscriptions from the fourth century BCE, uh, she was a goddess of overseeing the pool in Hades, uh, and she talks about this fact. Here it is. Um, uh, here it is. Uh, to memory. Fumigation from frankincense, the consort I invoke of Zeus divine, source of the holy, sweetly speaking, Mose nine, free from the oblivion of the fallen mind, but whom the soul with the intellect is joined, reasons increase and thought to thee belong, all powerful, pleasant, vigilant, and strong. So, you know, she is uh, indeed a, a goddess uh, to be revered, right? One gold tablet from Thessaly in northern Greece describes the dead soul as thirsty and shows how it is guided to a spring of water that will refresh and revive it. Yet before the soul may drink it, it is asked questions regarding its origins. The soul then has to answer these questions. So, so not only are you going to be drinking, you're going to be, you're going to be interviewed. So you got you got to interview, you got to figure out exactly what you're going to say. So uh, in the, um, Sakai tablets, S-F-A-K-A-K-I, 
of the second century BCE, a cypress tree accompanies the final spring of memory. So if you're not sure exactly which pond it is, it's the one that has the cypress tree on the right and says, I am parched with thirst and I perish, but give me to drink of the ever flowing spring on the right with the cypress. Who are you? Where do you come from? This inscription keeps saying. You guys ready for what you're supposed to respond? You guys you want to write this one down? Okay. I am a son of earth and starry heaven. Or I am a daughter of earth and starry heaven. You have to recognize the fact that you are, you're both a Dionysian spirit and you do have a titanic flesh. You have to say that. There's more. With the question asked, the new, newly deceased knows to identify himself as part heaven and part earth, but there's more. Uh, there is the Hipponian tablet discovered in 1969 and says as follows, this grave belongs to Mensoni for the time when he shall die. On the right side of the well-fitted house of Hades is a spring and close to this stands a shining cypress. Around this place, the descending soul cools themselves. Do not approach this spring, but proceed to the lake of memory with cold water flowing forth. There are guardians here, here and they will ask you with shrewd speech what you are looking for in the darkness of deadly Hades. Say, I am a son of earth and starry heaven, and I am parched with thirst and perishing, but give me to drink from the cold water from memory's lake, and they will show you to the Chthonian king and give you to drink from memory's lake, and then having drunk, you will walk on the holy path of the many on which also other renowned Mystai and Bacchae walk. So you are given the special water, this living water that enables you to have eternal life. Wait, does that sound familiar at all? Is this making sense? Wow. Do you think that it again in the Bible, do you think people, you know, of course they know this. It's common knowledge. As emphasized here, the individual soul must at all costs remember their individual identity. Now, you got in, right? You guys, you guys made it. Congratulations. You guys done yet? Entrance to this blissful life hereafter was, was initiated by the reception of wine. You ever feel like that? You know, it's been a long life like a long day, just kind of tired. I think I need to have a glass of wine. That's, what, that's, what's, that's what's gonna happen. They're gonna hand you wine. <laughs> you will have wine as your honored gift, unquote. Wow, you really do get some wine. Yeah. And another, but you also have something else. A reference here, and many tablets also talk about an immersion in milk. Hey, if you don't wanna have wine, I guess you get immersed in milk. In fact, there's even magical formulas that connect to this milk. Of course, milk was directly related to also Dionysus as much as wine. Milk was also connected to life, birth, and even semen, right? But was also connected to the stars. And this is where you're going to learn something you never knew before, maybe. Connected to the stars, the special stars, because you're not done. You have a place to go. Having now had the wine, having this milk or being immersed in the milk, the milk of the stars, because there is, according to the ancients, a pathway to heaven. It's called the Milky Way. Ah, you're going, oh, wait, wait, what? You, you didn't know that, did you, right? Sources, anybody? I'm giving it to you right now. So what happens is the Milky Way, since the 7th century BCE, the idea that what's up there as the Milky Way was believed, 
Parmenides refers to the Milky Way as the place of heavenly milk. According to Pindar, the soul of the righteous went along what was called Zeus's way to the Isles of the Blessed. Uh, Posidippus refers to the road of the mystic way. Uh, as early as Pythagoras, the soul was divine and originated from the stars, and so the righteous souls would go to the stars once more, or to the Isles of the Blessed, which was mystically connected to the realm of heaven or the underworld, and which was indeed understood as being the Milky Way. Uh, one of the references to milk in initiation is also found uh, in uh, one of the scrolls, theory number one. It says, but whatever the soul leaves the light of the sun to the right, I am well cautious more than anything else. Hail you who have suffered the suffering, but this has never happened to you before. You have become a God from human. A kid has fallen into the milk. Hail, hail, you travel to the right to the holy grassy meadows of Persephone. Wow, is this cool? You've fallen into the milk. You're like a kid. Uh, the, the animal form, not the little kid. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, so you, there you have it. So, um, of course, uh, you're going to have other aspects here. Oh, so much to go through. Um, another golden tablet mentions the, the falling in milk as equated as to moving from human to the gods. Also, many scholars agree that the first three lines of this one tablet uh, was part of another initiation ritual. It says, pure I come out of the pure queen of the underworld and both Euclid and Eubolius and all the other mortal gods for I too maintain to be of your blessed kind but fate subdued me and all the other immortal gods from star flung thunderbolt I have flown out of the grievous troublesome circle I have passed with swift feet to the desired wreath I have entered under the bosom of the lady of the house the queen of the underworld I have passed with swift feet from the desired wreath. Happy and blessed, you shall become a god, the opposite of the mortal, a kid. I have fallen into the milk. Thank you. See that? All right. Is everybody here? I actually never saw anybody. Oh, these are people here. All right, there we go. And all right. So you guys feel like you know the mysteries a little bit? Just a little bit? Did I convert you? Oh no. <laughs> I was like, oh no. Okay, so questions because there's quite a bit here, right? Uh, topics in the, uh, in the chat about uh, the incantations against flatulence. Uh, and there, there, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a book uh, called Distant Days where you can actually find these incantations against flagellants. Yes, if anyone is interested. Say the name real loud. Distant Days. Distant Days. There you go. Yeah. Translated by Benjamin Foster. All right. Sounds like an sounds like an exhaustive work. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. Doing Lovecraft next time. Thank you for being here. Somebody's asking, I'm unfamiliar with Hindu timelines, but which beliefs influence which? The 10,000 year birth, death, rebirth, or the Hindu concept of classic reincarnation? Okay, the answer to that question is a real difficult one because the answer to that question is the fact that they're contemporaneous to one another. So here we go, I'll, I'll, but I'll, I'll go through it, don't worry. So what we have, is you have a belief system in India known as Brahmanism. And Brahmanism, which is Indo-European, does not have the idea of reincarnation. It does not have the idea of karma. It does have the Vedas. But what's going to happen is that uh, the problems of Brahmanism will give birth to three religions. One, of course, uh, is Hinduism. One is Buddhism and one is Jainism, these three religions. And this happens between 700 to 500 BCE. This happens between 700 to 500 BCE. You have a work known as the Upanishads. And the Upanishads, around 600 BCE, 
talks about the idea of reincarnation. It talks about the idea of samsara, the idea of this wheel of life, of death and rebirth. But guess what? This particular work is contemporaneous to the exact same time as the Orphic mysteries are coming about in the five and the four hundreds. So they are contemporaneous to one another. So what is the answer to this? It's called the trade routes. There must have been, uh, and there was, uh, those of the Indic philosophy traveling one way on the highways, and there must have been uh, travelers going the other way and they're sharing their wares, their ideas. So as they trade uh, in silk and in ivory and in incense, they're also trading ideas of religion. And so the two kind of come together. So, so they are, so Orphism uh, is contemporaneous uh, to this idea in India, the same time. Does that answer the question? Um, Michelle is asking, can you talk more about the accursed beans? Or the cursed beans? Yeah. I don't know a lot more about the beans. Okay. <laughs> yeah, limited knowledge, although, uh, there, there, are, there is quite a bit on the beans, uh, you know, and, and the fact that they are cursed and that they're not true legumes, you know, that they're, you know, that they have different chambers and these, and, and because these chambers uh, have an odd number, uh, they're considered unlucky. So there's also the morphology or the shape of the beans, many of these beans that also contributes to the idea that they're bad luck. And it's also believed that these, there's, there's, there's in this air and the, there's this, uh, there's a spirit in it, you know, and, uh, and it's obviously not a good spirit. And it doesn't work very well with us, if that makes any sense. <laughs> I guess I gave an answer. So you're not going to spill the beans? I'm not going to spill the beans. <laughs> That's good. Who said that? Michelle. That's good. good. Good job, Michelle. Thank you. I love that. Uh, when, do, when should I expect a, a, a connection between uh, the, the, the connection between India uh, and, of course, uh, Greece and Rome? That talk is already written. It's already completed. And I gave it to Cal State Fullerton. And I can always do it here. Yeah, the, 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 the quotes from here on doing that one. Yeah, it's already written. I already presented it at, as, a, as a major talk at Cal State Fullerton. Okay, so, so would like to. So, 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 it's, so it is done. Okay. I even have outlines for this one. All right. Yeah, so maybe we could do that after Lovecraft. I don't know. Okay. You guys would be interested. Because I go into detail. I even give names. Yes. That's so, yes. so that's yes. all good. India and Greece. So, yeah. Any other questions? And look, it didn't rain. You felt it? It didn't rain. <laughs> and that was the end of Dr. Reedfeld. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was electrocuted. Yeah, any, any other questions? Oh, I do feel the. Oh, I just just when I said that, I felt the drop on my neck. Yeah, that was pretty messed up. I shouldn't have said anything. I just. Did you guys enjoy the talk? Yeah. Um, do you feel like you've learned something different? Uh, yeah. Yeah, familiar. Yeah, or you already knew this beforehand. Only bits and pieces. Just very little. Barely ever paid attention. I'm sorry, it's raining. <laughs> That's so funny. I need help putting yourself away. That's funny. I just said, and oh, it's just, I feel it too. Okay. Yeah. All right. Shut it down. Tell so, us, so thank us. you for being here. Thank you so much. Um, it is raining. Yep. So, okay, we're going. So, Bye. we're going. Bye. Wow.